Good morning. Um, welcome um, to everyone. Um, thank you very much for your attendance today uh, for this uh, round table devote to geometric algebra applications to power systems and um, electrical engineering. I'm really honored um, to participate in this event and I'm very happy um, that um, attention is being paid uh, to new application of geometric algebra to electrical engineering in general and power systems in particular. Um, so as I said, um, the aim of this round table is to present to the scientific community uh, the current applications of um, geometric algebra to electrical systems. Of course, uh, these kind of systems have um, an undeniable relevance and significance in, in our today's society. Um, so their analysis is crucial for our reliable and effective operation. Um, different fields such as um, uh, power theory, circuit theory, or microwave theory um, can benefit of GA, geometric algebra, due to its uh, multidimensional nature. Um, as you may know, traditional, uh, traditionally, uh, matrix algebra and complex numbers have been the day-to-day -day work for electrical engineers. Uh, but certain challenges um, um, ha has been raised for the proper interpretation of the physical phenomena involved. Um, other tools such as tensors, quaternions, or different uh, uh, differential forms have been proposed in the past to um, uh, mitigate this, these problems. Uh, thanks to geometric algebra, uh, it is possible to unify all these tools and for example, interpret power flows in power system um, uh, from a more intuitive um, and physical point of view. Um, finally, uh, the main applications developed today will be presented and discussed by experts in the field. So for the organization of this round table, um, all the experts uh, will present their talk and after that, um, a discussion will be available for all, for all the people. So the first presenter uh, is Professor Javier Prado from the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Uh, professor Prado is a recently retired physics and chemistry professor with a PhD in science teaching based on the use of Minkowski diagrams to teach the relativistic effects. He developed the concept of dim dimensional scaffolding and published several papers on this subject with Professor Jorge Mira and other collaborators. They recently joined Dr. Montoya's research on the use of geometric algebra for power theory. Um, so Javier, um, please remember that you have about uh, nine minutes for your presentation and the floor is yours. Hi everybody. First of all, let me apologize because my English is not so fluent as I would like. I hope you have an understanding for it. Uh, I am not able, I am not sure if I can share my screen with you. Shall I try? One second, I'll set it up for you. Because the system does, uh, does not allow me to share my screen. Wait, I forgot your name. Can you remind me? Xavier. My name is Xavier. Can you hear me? Hang on, I don't see you on the participants list. Hang on. Oh, there, hang on. Nice. Type the letter in here. Okay, one second. Okay, you should be host now. Um, so you should be able to share your screen. Okay, thank you. Do you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll begin now the presentation. Well, good morning. My name is Xavier Prado, and it is my pleasure to present here our work entitled Dimensional Scaffolding of Electromagnetism and Power Theory with Geometric Algebra. 
With dimensional scaffolding, we mean changing the number of spatial dimensions in order to gain more insight on a physical situation. This can be used as a teaching procedure. And in fact, oh, I don't know what happened. Rumor has it control L should uh, get you back to where you want to be. No, it does not work. I didn't make nothing. So, but I, maybe I can try with this, but it is very, very small. Zoom. Well, Xavier, maybe you want to try to quit and, and enter again. Your enter again, maybe. I will try then. Oh, do you see now the screen? Yeah, you can continue, please. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Well, uh, I was telling you that concepts like speed or acceleration are introduced as numerical values in one dimension. In two dimensions, the concept of vector allows to a further study on these same magnitudes. Finally, length contraction and other relativistic effects can be explained using one plus one space-time diagrams. Our original aim was to apply this teaching strategy in electromagnetism. This would expand the use of reduced dimensions available in modern physics. For example, in general relativity, where one-dimensional space-time Kruskal or Penrose diagrams are used to analyze the properties of non-rotating black holes, or in one-dimensional boxes, which are also being commonly used to explain the behavior of quantum waves. Information about our proposal can be found in the reference. In doing this, we found that geometric algebra offers a perfect tool for dimensional scaffolding. The physical magnitudes become multivectors inheriting their geometric properties. The same equations are valid in different dimensions, depending on the types and grades of the multivector quantities. And also, translation between space and space-time is straightforward. Now, I would like to introduce you to our results after applying dimensional scaffolding to electromagnetism with the help of geometric algebra. Maxwell's laws fit into a single expression using geometric calculus, where the vector derivative of the bivector electromagnetic field F is equal to the charge current vector J. In one dimension, this same expression gives rise to the loss of Gauss and Ampere, acting only over electric fields, since a magnetic field does not exist in one dimension. In two dimensions, the magnetic field appears as a b-vector or pseudoscalar. The three-vector part of the field equation must vanish identically, and this condition is known as the law of Faraday. Space-time splits allow to translate from space-time multivectors to the classic representation in vector space. Let me show here some of the main results we obtained in reduced dimensions. One dimension is enough to introduce magnitudes like charge, current, electric field, potential, gauge, and displacement current. Also, magnetic fields do not exist in one dimension. Null cones and retarded time are essential already in one plus one Minkowski space time. Faraday's law for the, the induction of the magnetic field appears in two dimensions, and the propagation of pulses at the speed of light can be visually analyzed in space-time diagrams. The role of the magnetic field, displacement current, and the pointing vector in electromagnetic wave di bidimensional diagrams is the same as in electric circuits. And here you have an example on how our work on electromagnetism can be applied. The theory of electric power flow a theory in which we have already done some work with Professor Gil Montoya. Using geometric algebra, a simple quadratic equation encodes the main magnitudes in power theory. 
in one dimension, its scalar part renders the stress energy or Maxwell tensor, which offers an alternative non-local approach to the electromagnetic forces. In two dimensions, its vector part renders the pointing vector, which is fundamental for power transmission. Its behavior in three dimensions is complicated, but it can be simplified in two dimensions using the concept of power channel. Please note that this makes the core of our work in this field. Some interesting physical results appear already in one dimension. The Lorentz force between two parts of an electromagnetic system can be calculated directly from the field values. This is a global alternative to local equations based on charges, like Coulomb's law. The null propagator for potentials appears already in one dimension, where the question about its physical meaning remains open. On the other side, the displacement current, JD, is a compensating effect for drift currents. The reason is that Ampere's law in one dimension must give a null value for the magnetic part. In two dimensions, we found additional facts. The interaction between currents and magnetic fields is now very clear. We can recognize here how an electric current, J, drags the magnetic vectors around it. In this other diagram, the vertical axis represents the passage of time where an induced electric field, E, arises from a varying magnetic field, B. Displacement current and pointing vector in electromagnetic waves gain physical meaning when compared with their behavior in two-dimensional circuits. Power channels in two dimensions suppress energy dissipation due to the 3D geometry, focusing the analysis on the role of frequencies in the energy flow. As Professor Montoya will show in the frequency representation using geometric algebra, the application of the potential vector inverse on the power B vector produces two intensities. One is a vector quantity IP, which has been already studied. The other one, IM, is a new magnitude. And the fact that its three vector part must be identically null imposes some conditions on it. Are we speaking about real or toy worlds? You might wonder if these are real or only apparent effects, because in the real three-dimensional world, there are fringe effects and energy losses which do not appear in two dimensions. However, it can be shown that this is not an obstacle for the usefulness of our results. In fact, nature offers several examples of situations which can be analyzed in reduced dimensions. Fringe effects are unappreciable at the working frequencies used in power theory, and energy losses can be minimized with the appropriate symmetries, for example, in waveguides. On the other hand, physical systems with reduced dimensions are increasingly appearing. For example, one-dimensional structures like monolinear molecules or even the neurons of our nervous system and two-dimensional layers like graphene-like surfaces or the brain cortex where in all those cases, the dimensional scaffolding results based on geometric algebra can offer an appropriate theoretical framework. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. The next presenter is Alex Arsenovich. Dr. Arsenovich received a Bachelor of Science and PhD in Electrical Engineering from the University of Virginia in 2007 and 2012, respectively. He continues to work closely with the University of Virginia and has authored and co-authored over 15 technical papers in the field of microwave metrology and geometric algebra. In 2016, he created 810 Labs LLC to continue providing the services to microwave technology. Um, 
to microgrid metrology, sorry, software development and applied mathematics. Um, his key of interest is in modernizing the theoretical and computational tools used by electrical engineers and scientists. So Alex, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much and thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm from A10 Lab out of Virginia and I'm gonna give a pretty quick talk today about uh, a spinner model for cascading two port microwave networks. So this is a paper contents. I'm really just gonna get to touch on a couple of points, uh, mainly the context of why I'm doing this and to give you an application. And the rest of the paper uh, is actually pretty trivial from a geometric algebra perspective. Okay, so context and motivation, what's a microwave network? So microwaves are kind of loosely defined as the section of the electromagnetic spectrum between radio waves and light. So this is what a microwave circuit typically looks like, one manifestation of one. And at these frequencies, wave mechanics becomes more important than capacitors and inductors and voltages and current. So we use a formalism uh, mostly called scattering parameters, and it's also used in quantum mechanics and some acoustic applications. And it's a complex uh, linear algebra-based model. So just to give you some examples of some microwave two-port circuits, here's a pair of antennas in an antenna chamber. Here's a waveguide twist at, I don't know, 70 gigahertz or something. And as the frequencies get higher, the circuits get smaller. So here's a circuit fabricated at the University of Virginia and they use photolithographic methods at really high frequencies. And then how do you measure something like that? Well, they have these really sophisticated probes that very delicately land on the chips that they manufacture these, these uh, circuits on. And they have that infrastructure working up to about a terahertz, which is kind of amazing. Okay, so scattering parameters, that's the formalism we use. What's good about these uh, are that they're physically meaningful. So the elements of this scattering matrix relate the incident waves, which are the A's, which are complex numbers, to the reflected waves, which are B's. And uh, the scattering parameters themselves, so the elements of the matrix are reflection and transmission coefficients. So you can interpret them physically. Uh, the other thing that's good is that a lossless network is represented as a unitary matrix. So that's nice. Symmetry is also represented uh, nicely with matrix operations. The bad thing, and this is important, is that the matrix product is not useful. And that's a big problem. So they develop transfer parameters just by moving some of the A's and B's around the independent variables. And then you can relate this new matrix to the old scattering matrix as such. And the good thing about this matrix is that the uh, active cascading networks is implemented now with the matrix product. So if you have a lot of networks in series, you can just multiply their transfer parameters together to get the net result. So that's, that's really important. The other thing which is really nice is that reciprocity is now uh, represented with the unitary matrix and reciprocity is the physical law. And that encapsulates a lot more uh, devices than just losslessness. So that's essential. Uh, the bad is that the elements now of this matrix are not interpretable. And the bad thing about this and the scattering representation are that they're matrices, right? And so we all know those have problems. And so we want to solve this problem with geometric algebra. So just to recap, what am I doing? Okay, we have some reality, which are these microwave two port circuits. We have some existing model, which is a linear algebra based approach. And we're trying to translate that into geometric algebra so that we can gain some insight and maybe, you know, be able to solve some problems in a different way. So this is just a one slide uh, description of how we did this, but obviously the paper will give more detail. How we did it is really not that important. The interpretations of the resulting spinners are what really the paper focuses on. But in either case, so if we have some two port network S here, it's terminated at port two with some load that generates a reflection coefficient gamma two, okay? Then if we can express gamma one in terms of gamma two, parameterized by the elements of the scattering matrix, we get what's called the reflectometry equation. And there's a lot of ways you can derive this. This is kind of a basic uh, result of physics or electrical engineering. So once we have this, uh, we can see, well, hey, this is a conformal transformation. So I can rewrite it as such. And each one of these elements of the scattering matrix parameterizes this conformal transformation. So I have a translation, a dilation rotation, and a transversion. Now, once you have that, okay, you can go into conformal geometric algebra, represent this as spinners, and everything's good. What's really interesting is that the conformal geometric algebra for this space is the same as space-time algebra, so you get one-to-one -one 
you know, analogs, which I think is really, uh, could be really useful. Some results. Okay, so we did that. What, what can we do with this? So one application that I looked at was interpolation. So we have some device here. We're going to measure or simulate that device to get a list of scattering matrices, right? Generally over frequency. Now, the current approach is that we're going to take one element of that matrix, project it down into the real and imaginary components, so all the S11s, all the real and imaginary components, and interpret those scalarly. Okay, big problem that doesn't preserve unitarity. You can imagine it's going to introduce all kinds of artifacts. So maybe we should interpolate the spinner like they do with the motors and the kinematics and things. So that's what we tried. So how are we going to evaluate this? We have a circuit. We're going to simulate this circuit, we're going to have a list of matrices that are true. We're then going to downsample it and then interpolate it and compare the interpolated result with the true result. So everything's done on a computer. The device uh, under test in this case is just a slab of glass with some air padding on each side. So it's a pretty simple network, but it gives you some nice mismatch and resonant behavior. And it's actually a useful test case for material characterization, which is a problem of interest at high frequencies. So here are some results. This is a reflection coefficient uh, shown in log scale from one to 10 gigahertz. And you can see here in the blue, the blue line is showing the true result. The black dots are showing the sampled result, which is very sparsely sampled. And then the red and the orange dashed lines show the Cartesian, which is kind of default interpolation. And the orange line is the uh, orange dashed line is the spinner version. And you can see here the spinner version is uh, obviously much better. Here's the same result uh, looking at a projection of the transmission coefficient in log uh, mag scale, kind of similar results. So these look kind of amazing. If we look at it in a little bit of a larger dimensional space, we look at the complex reflection coefficient on the left and the complex transmission coefficient on the right, we kind of get a feel more for what's going on. And the background lines, don't worry about those, those are, that's called the Smith chart. That's like a microwave engineering thing. But in either case, it's less miraculous, but it's still amazing. Like how are the, how is this interpolated result able to infer these curves, right? Well, you know, I think the answer is that it's this network, this piece of glass is a really simple structure. The spinner is very simple. And the fact that we're representing it in the matrix we're really obfuscating the truth. And that's why taking all these little projections and interpolating them is giving us horrible results. So what you wanna know is how is this gonna do on average and how fast is it gonna converge compared to existing results? So here's a plot of the interpolation error on the y-axis and log scale versus sampling rate on the x-axis from zero to 25%. And this just illustrates that the new method converges rapidly compared to both uh, a couple of the old ones. The Cartesian is the one I explained, the rational I didn't explain, but anyway, it's much better. The results are much better. Okay, so that's it. That's basically uh, all I'm going to talk about. So just in conclusion, I just want to give you like an example, uh, an idea of where this fits in with everything that exists already. So a model, the context for this model. So let's say we're starting from space-time as the best model we have. So electrical engineers immediately go to time harmonic Maxwell equations. That's where we start, okay? Then to do microwave engineering, we're gonna start by further confining space in the transverse dimension. So it's a partial space harmonic solution, and that leads us to transmission lines. So we've confined space in both, you know, in the temporal dimension and in the space, two spatial dimensions. And then that leads us to network theory. It then gets more complicated because we've you know, reduced this problem a lot, and then we add a lot of different ports to our network, so it gets more complicated. But in either case, all of these different you know, sub-disciplines are taught using different structures, vector calculus, Mobius transformations, linear algebra. And so what we did in this paper is show that we can represent some portions of network theory using spinners. We also showed you could do the same thing with transmission line theory. But what's really amazing to me is that this allows the electrical engineers to talk to the quantum guys because the spinner mechanisms are all the same. So you can have a one-to-one -one analog. So what we'd really like to do, obviously, is go straight from space-time algebra all the way across the board and just stop in at all these little disciplines and be able to you know, explain how they all relate to each other. So that's kind of the overall goal. We've done a small portion of it, and uh, that's all I have today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So thank you very much, Alex. Okay, let's move on to the next the next presenter.
Yeah, the next presenter is Ahmad Aid. Professor Aid is a lecturer and faculty member at the Department of Electrical Engineering, the Faculty of uh, Engineering, Port Said University, Egypt. He received his computer engineering PhD in 2010 from Port Said University on the topic of uh, generative programming of geometric models formulated using geometric algebra. His main research interest targets the computational application of geometric algebra in various uh, engineering domains through generative programming and metaprogramming techniques. Um, in years 2011 to 2019, uh, Professor Aid designed uh, and developed a source-to-source -source optimize, optimizing compiler called GMAC to serve his main research interest. More recently, he has developed a new extensive software library called GA Full to become a practical tool aiding electrical engineers in the investigations on various levels, symbolic, numerical, visual, and computational. So the floor is yours, Ahmad. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope my uh, voice is okay. Uh, Yes, it's okay. Yes, okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is Ahmed. Uh, I am from Borsaid University, Egypt. I am very happy to be with you today. Today, I'm talking about uh, a few points. Uh, I will be presenting a summary of some of the collaborative work with Dr. Montoya. I will hint at some of the capabilities of the software like they we develop. Uh, uh, and, your, uh, your audio is not very clear. Okay. Is it better now? Closer to the speaker. Okay. Is this better? I think that's a little better. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I will have at some of the capabilities of the software library we developed. Then I will go directly to a couple of formulations we made related to our system engineering. As you can see from the chart, there is an increased interest for geometric algebra in power engineering fields. Uh, however, very little of this research emphasizes the important educational aspect of using geometric algebra in power engineering. Many fundamental concepts in power engineering have strong geometric interpretations and relations. We believe that by expressing and exploiting this geometric interpretation, we can create a connected space of ideas for young engineers and a fresh perspective on familiar concepts and tools for experienced engineers. So, so the main goal of this collaboration work is to create a bridge of geometric ideas by formulating basic power engineering concepts using geometric algebra. My contribution to this approach uh, is to use a software library I developed for uh, uh, JE Full, as Professor Montoya said. We can uh, use this library to explore and visualize geometric algebra formulations of power engineering concepts in addition to perform actual computations or real data. And we hope to att attract more interest to this work uh, uh, using this presentation. JLPOL is short for Geometric Algebra Fulcrum Library. It has two main design aspects. Geometric algebra is at the core of its mathematical aspect, and a generic software design is, uh, is the basis of its computational aspect. In JLPOL, a separate Geometric algebra manipulation, we separate the geometric algebra manipulation of multi vectors from the specific implementation of underlying scalars. We use abstract scalars. The user can choose whatever suitable kind of numbers to his task. Uh, for example, we can use uh, numbers, real numbers, complex numbers. We can use symbolic expressions. We can use uh, even sample signals, uh, polynomials, whatever uh, uh, that can be abstracted as a scalar is usable in this library. Now we begin in our first formulation. Uh, uh, we begin from uh, the simple uh, search of voltage and current laws. Uh, we can uh, formulate this as a simple dot product between two vectors. The vector K contains uh, ones, only ones, very simple. The vector X contains the, the voltages of current in the circuit. It can have many components, no problem. Uh, uh, in using this uh, formulation and the constraint uh, with the dot product, we find that uh, this defines a hyperplane 
in uh, n-dimensional space, the signal will reside always in this hyperplane. We call it uh, the Kirch of subspace. This is also always orthogonal to the vector k. If we now rotate this system uh, so that the vector k coincides with an, a, a coordinate axis, uh, we uh, introduce a zero, a zero component to the signal. This is what Clark transformation does in electrical power systems. The bus transform is just a time-dependent rotation inside the uh, Kirchhoff of uh, subspace. It's always orthogonal to the uh, Kirchhoff of vector. Uh, using the symbolic capabilities of uh, the library, uh, we find that if we project the, or, the coordinate axis, we call them here mu1 to mu n, on the Kirchhoff of uh, subspace, we get uh, special generalized space vector transformation. So, all these transformations are geometrically related and very simple uh, to uh, explain using this geometric construction. Of course, geometric algebra can be used to express all this very simply. Uh, and this was the base for our simple terms of rotation framework or SPF framework uh, to relate all this together. Uh, using the library again, the symbolic capability of this time, uh, we could generate a general pattern of rotors or matrices, whatever uh, one pleases to use, uh, to express this simple curves of rotation. Uh, and this is, can be done automatically. We can use whatever uh, part of this framework we need uh, and translate the information back and forth uh, with anyone. The second formulation uh, is uh, instantaneous geometric frequency. Uh, here we adopted a differential geometric uh, method from Professor David Hastings and Garrett Subject uh, a book, Therefore, Algebra to Geometric Calculus, Chapter 6, to compute a generalized uh, uh, frequency uh, applicable to a power signal. It has a, a geometric component, uh, basically a bivector and a scalar magnitude. The instantaneous geometric frequency is time dependent. It's like directly related to the well-known uh, screening carrot curvature coefficients, which describe the kinematic properties of a particle moving along a differential curve in Euclidean space. Uh, Dr. Montoya will talk much more about this in a later session. This is the formulation we use. It's very simple in terms of geometric algebra mathematics, but I need to uh, emphasize one problem we face in this formulation. To use uh, differential geometry, we must have a differential term uh, first. But typically, we have sample data, uh, a series signal, for example, with, sample, uh, with many samples. We need to uh, find an interpolation method that can be differentiated to higher dimensions. This turns uh, out to be a very difficult problem, uh, at least for me, at first. The problem is that uh, there are many, uh, many actually continuous differentiable functions that can interpolate a given uh, sample signal. Uh, of course, if we use uh, uh, naive interpolation, we get much noise in the first and second and third derivatives. This grows exponentially and we lose any useful information uh, in the original signal. Uh, we lose any hope of applying uh, differential geometry to use this value. We managed to find a good interpolation uh, algorithm that uh, gives us uh, smooth, uh, higher derivatives while uh, being very close to the original sample signal. So we didn't lose any information uh, in regards to the signal. And we found uh, it very simple to implement and uh, apply using our library. This video shows uh, the other part I'm talking about here, we can visualize all this using the library. Uh, this single diagram contains many information about the signal itself, the curve uh, being drawn, uh, the tangent frame, uh, E1, C2, and E3, uh, how this is all related to uh, the, uh, the bi vectors or the geometric frequency. Uh, the disk that is being uh, drawn at the center uh, represents the actual. Uh, instantaneous geometric frequency concept we uh, are talking about. And this can be done for any signal, uh, either uh, synthetic for illustration or real data, uh, as in the following video. This video shows real data uh, and how this uh, changes at a false condition. Uh, uh, the signal was very regular at first, and then the false condition.
transmission uh, occurs, uh, and that uh, the behavior of the signal changes completely, a student can uh, understand much more visually using this uh, technique. Now, if we can uh, think about this more, uh, the instantaneous geometric frequency can be used uh, along with the simple curves of rotation. Uh, if we can predict where the uh, curves of vector will be next, maybe using a Kalman filter or a neural network, uh, we can uh, extract more information from the signal using this geometrically holistic approach. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Mr. Aid. Um, finally, myself, Francisco Montoya. I received my master's science in electrical engineering from the University of Malaga in Spain in 2000, and uh, my PhD in 2009 in evolutionary optimization techniques applied to power systems from the University of Granada. Um, I'm a member of the engineering department of the University of Almeria where I've spent uh, the last 15 years as an associate professor, now a full professor, researching and teaching in areas such as power system, renewable energy, and optimization. I've published more than 70 papers in journal, conference, and workshops. Um, I am one of the creators of the geometric algebra power framework applied to power system in frequency and time domain. So I need the... Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Everyone in the chat, can, or everyone on uh, online, can you guys still hear us? Yep, yep. Awesome. I don't know which one that is. Uh, yeah, yeah, it should be this one next, maybe. Yeah, but that's master or is that master? Does anyone know how to turn PowerPoint to uh, notes mode off the top of their head? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm working on Mac, so I, I don't know exactly which. Yes, yeah, so I, I do. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So here, we, so we go, so we go here. Wait, hang on, where's the, let's see. So we go here. Okay, yeah, it's not. Yes, no, I, I want to see my notes. Yes, you need to. Oh, I have no idea how to do that. Can you help me out? Yeah, I'm a Mac user, so I. Thank you so much. Uh, so you need to do that, and then we get to look at the humble. Uh, but hopefully. Yeah, let's see. Uh, oh, use presenter view. There we go. So as I say from the beginning. Oh, wait, we lost. Is the projector off? That's strange. Uh, oh, yeah, it's still there. So that's fine. Okay, nice. It's okay. So if I go slide, it's not quite monitor that one, I think. Uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you so much. Nice. Thank, Thank you, you so much. To make sure it's screen sharing. It's yep. so, so we go here. Right. 
David, is it, is it screen sharing in Zoom? I can't tell from here. It's not screen sharing. Okay, so I don't want to mess this up. Let's see. Um, oh. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we minimize. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Oh, okay, so we don't want the, oops. Oh, wait, where'd it go? Oh, hang on, I lost something here. Just to minimize. Yeah. Let's minimize. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think I lost Zoom. Yeah, I think I lost Zoom here. Uh, here, let's see here. It's still sharing? Okay, how do I find it then? Uh, I don't see Zoom now either. Yeah, yeah, maybe it might be Have gone. we exit the slides here somehow? No, it's still sure. Yeah. Okay, it still says it's there. Yeah, okay, so you stop share and now reshare. Okay. All right. And then I'll restart the... Okay, so I want to I want to so share the... Share screen two. Just screen two, slide. okay. And then if we do slide show, then you show, you should remember that I said. Yeah, that should work fine since it's from the beginning. Yep, here we go. Okay, thank you. And what is my presentation here? Yeah, what are the notes? No, I mean, I mean, how to put in my presentation. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, let's go. So, uh, this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, first of all, I will briefly introduce the basic concept of, um, of um, power systems, so the power flow in, in electrical system mainly. Uh, for this, I need to present the approach, um, two approaches, uh, two traditional approaches, both in time and frequency domain. And then I will comment on, on um, how geometric algebra can be used um, uh, to reformulate power theories and also how to, learn, uh, how to solve some long uh, standing problems, both in frequency and also in time domain. And finally, if we have time, I don't think so, I'd like to present some physical interpretation we provide um, thanks to the use of geometric algebra. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you to the topic of power flow in electrical system. Um, they are very important, of course, for our, for our current way of life and their analysis and, and optimization is essential um, for inefficient management. So the layout of a typical power grid is shown in the figure. Um, it includes several elements such as generators, transformers and, and loads, and, and of course, of transmission lines. Um, generally, these grids are usually analyzed in steady state, but um, assuming that parameters are stable over time, also it is also important to study some transients such as over voltage that may occur in the event of, of failure of, of faults. Um, traditionally, uh, the grid is also analyzed mainly in terms of, of frequency, and mostly focused on 50 or uh, 60 Hertz. Um, in this vis visualization, um, you can see uh, an animated diagram, and we can see the power flow from generators to load through the transmission line. This is quite typical in, in power systems. Okay, uh, traditionally the frequency domain uh, has been extensively used in power system. Um, as in so many other areas, complex algebra has played um, a fundamental role. Uh, the idea is that the periodical signals uh, are analyzed in terms of an infinite uh, sum of Fourier terms. In our case, uh, we use that for voltage and currents. Uh, each element or harmonic component uh, for both voltage and currents um, are usually transferred to the complex domain. Uh, in electrical terminology, uh, we call that phasers. Then in an attempt to create an analog to the instantaneous power, um, the product of the voltage phasor and the conjugate current phasor is realized. Um, this result as key is known as the apparent power of the Keith harmonic. And frankly, it has never uh, been explained too well in the, in the textbooks. Um, note that the total apparent power that does not satisfy the Telegans theorem, um, which is um, intimately linked to the principle of conservation of energy. This is one of the great limitations of, of the frequency power theory based on complex numbers. Interestingly, it has been possible to solve um, um, 
it has been impossible to solve in the last 120 years. So the use of geometric algebra has been made possible uh, to overcome this situation. Um, some interesting formulas are shown here for convenience. The first one is the definition of the key harmonic apparent power in rectangular form um, with the real and imaginary terms. Uh, the real term is now as the active power. Um, it has a clear meaning uh, that uh, it's that to produce useful work in the loads. Uh, the imaginary term is now as reactive power. Uh, contrary to the active power, it is a dispute concept without clear physical meaning. Uh, okay, uh, as an important conclusion of using the frequency domain approach, uh, it should be noted that the use of complex algebra prevents the computation of, of the cross product of voltage and current harmonics. For example, um, the product between um, the voltage phase of order three and the current phase of order seven does not make any sense at all uh, because of the, the, the limitation of complex algebra. This cannot be computed in electrical engineering. Um, the, the alternative approach in power theory is based on the time domain. Uh, it is perhaps the most uh, physical appealing, but it also the most unexplored, although uh, it is quite relevant in certain aspects, such as uh, design of active current compensators, which are used for minimal energy losses in transmission grids. This theory, unlike the frequency domain approach, is based on a matrix or tensor algebra for general multi-phase system, but for three-phase systems, we only need the cross product. Um, of course, there is, no need, uh, there is no need of Fourier transform in this case. A multi-phase system, a vector, uh, is defined for, for voltage or current, whose coordinates are uh, the voltage of current or current values for each phase. Then the instantaneous power is obtained as a scalar product of both vectors. It should be emphasized that it has a clear and accepted physical meaning supported by Maxwell's equations. Okay, uh, in a similar vein to the frequency approach, the traditional time domain uh, theory is defined um, a non physical quantity known as the instantaneous reactive power. For a multi phase system, the most refined uh, version is defined as a combination of tensor products, as shown in this expression, where the tensor products among current and voltage are defined, as shown here. For the special case of three phase system, which are widely used, um, the instantaneous reactive power is simply the cross product of the voltage and the current vectors. Um, uh, how to apply geometric algebra to power flow, circuit theory, or other topics in electrical engineering? Um, for the frequency domain approach, just use the concept of isomorphism between uh, vector spaces, more precisely between the time Fourier basis and the Euclidean basis. So the voltage and current can be expressed as Euclidean vectors, as shown here. Thus, uh, this allows us to employ the geometric uh, product uh, and create a rather new non-physical power, the geometric power M, with interesting properties for an engineering and economical point of view. Um, this power has mainly two terms that can be further detailed in, in three terms if needed. The first one is the active power, exactly the same as in the complex uh, algebra approach. Um, note that this is always a real number. This is a scalar, of course. Uh, the Budeano geometric reactive power, which is uh, a bivector, and it is a result of the products of orthogonal components of voltage and current of the same frequency. And finally, uh, the bivector MD, which is a new element not previously disclosed in the traditional complex algebra. Um, it is a genuine contribution of geometric algebra in this topic. So geometric algebra has helped the power theory to found a new term that has interesting property and it was never known before. Uh, an interesting example of application is current compensation in power networks for minimal losses in transportation and distribution. Uh, by considering the geometric apparent power, it is possible uh, to find a current decomposition with the non-active uh, current IN that can be canceled out using power electronics in order to supply the same amount of active power, but with minimal energy losses. Um, this is because of Joule's law of course, in the wires, in the transmission model. 
Uh, given the relatively recent developments in the first approach for applying geometric algebra to power theory, there are still unsolved um, um, issues for further investigations. For example, how to extend the theory to multi-phase systems, uh, three, four, and, and uh, phase system. This is, a, this is a still unsolved. And what I call the double dimensionality problem. Well, we must not only deal with the multidimensionality associated to harmonics, but also an additional multidimensionality because of the arbitrary number of electrical phases. So we have M harmonics for every phase, and we have, for example, N phases. So it's a kind of double dimensionality, I call that. I have developed some idea with this regard, uh, but I'm open to collaboration to face these problems. Um, yeah, um, geometric algebra can be applied also to time domain. Um, in this case, what we build is a multidimensional Euclidean basis according to the number of electrical phases, instead of using the Fourier uh, basis in, as in the frequency approach, so that the coordinates of the voltage and the current vectors are now the corresponding values of the time dependent voltage and current of every phase. Uh, this result in an instantaneous geometric power uh, note that this power includes in a much more elegant and, and unified way, in my opinion, the instantaneous power of the scalar part and the instantaneous reactive power um, in its bivector part. As in the case of the frequency approach, it is uh, possible to find uh, through the inverse of the voltage, the minimum current uh, vector, which optimizes transmission losses. Uh, from my point of view, uh, it is clear that the use of geometric algebra is, um, provides a much more simple and unified framework uh, to face the problem of, um, of power flow in, in electrical engineering. And this is the reason uh, to promote geometric algebra as a powerful education tool, as I already do with my undergraduate students. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, oh, sorry, the conclusions. Um, here are the conclusions of the use of complex algebra and Fourier basis is a source of limitation for understanding of power flows and their economical impacts on power grids. Geometric algebra has uh, shed some light in this long standing discussion over the last 120 years regarding the reactive and apparent power. And finally, I consider that geometric algebra is the right approach to fully understand the internals of power system in a simplified and comprehensive way. So thank you very much. Thank you. We have, a, we have just a few minutes for questions according to roundtable. Yeah. Yes, I see. Um, hi, Anthony Lazenby here. So, question for this the last talk. So, you say that geometric algebra has enabled you to solve various long-standing problems in power transmission. But what, we, what you showed us was some definitions. So what, what, in what way have they solved the problems? Yeah, the problem was that uh, mainly regarding to the cross product of uh, current and voltages in the frequency domain. So the, the main thing here is that uh, if you are using complex algebra, you need to separate every frequency using a complex number for every current and every voltage, but you cannot mix, you cannot multiply voltages and currents of different frequency using those complex numbers. So uh, this is the problem. You cannot do that using complex algebra, but you can do that. So you find a new non-physical power that if you can cancel out uh, using power electronics, you get uh, a new way to optimize the, dis the distribution of energy of power in your power system. This is the main idea. But of course, uh, this is not the only one. Uh, you have, in my opinion, the right tool to face all the different tools, use of tensor, differential forms, quaternions, uh, complex algebra, everything can be solved. And I proved that in this work, uh, can be solved using geometric algebra. This is the idea. Yeah, I have a question. This is Alex Arsenovic here. So if, I mean, power costs money and if they've been computing the power incorrectly, then it seems like you could do an experiment pretty easily to demonstrate that 
calculating it correctly will save you energy and that people would be really interested in that. Is there a simple experiment you could do? Yeah, we perform some ex real experiments um, uh, by measuring uh, with yeah, voltage, current or multimeters, whatever. Um, we sample the voltage and the current and we do that uh, using whatever package, for example, GA4 is one of the package we use with, Mr. with Professor Aid. And, and yes, you compute it uh, uh, geometrically, then you perform the inverse of the voltage and you can um, um, obtain a new current, a theoretical new current, but it's just still under development, the, the application uh, for a real system uh, regarding the compensation of this current. So uh, we are not expert in the power electronics, so uh, we try to collaborate with other teams but um, yes, the, the theoretical basis bases are, are there, so um, it can be done. It can be compute. Just uh, it remains to be implemented in in somehow um, some kind of, of embed processor FPGA or something like that. So, if I understand what you're saying, you expect that once you can compensate more accurately for some reactive component that they're not now accounting for, that you expect there will be power saved, basically through a better match. Yes, you can do that in a special condition. So the easy part is you uh, use that in sinusoidal system, but when you have a harmonics and you have no linear loads, then the complex algebra became uh, useful. So you need to uh, employ an, another, um, another uh, way of compensation, for example, in time domain, which is an alternative uh, way of compensate uh, uh, non-linear loads. But in this way, in the frequency domain, we can also face this problem. So um, it provides an optimal way of compensating currents.